Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is David Chard. I'm the interim dean of Boston University's Wheelock College. And this evening's webinar is designed to give you an update on what you can expect for the fall 2020 semester at Boston University, and specifically as you pursue your studies and professional preparation at Wheelock College. The past several months have been a very challenging time for all of us, and we hope that you and your families are well, and if you've been directly impacted by COVID-19, uh, you have our deepest condolences. We are very excited about returning to campus this fall and look forward to welcoming you back to BU and back to Wheelock. Before I get started, I would like to um, introduce my colleagues that are joining us um, this evening and who will be helping, uh, helping me conduct this um, webinar. So let me begin with um, uh, Ellen Fazuski. Please introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. It's uh, nice to see some of you. Um, my name is Ellen Fazuski. I'm a clinical professor of science education as well as the Associate Dean for Student Affairs. Terrific. Paul Hastings. Hi, everyone. My name is Paul Hastings, and I'm Director of Student Services here at BU Wheelock, and I am going to be handling some of the questions on the Q&A tonight. Thank you. Ryan Lovell. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Good evening. My name is Ryan Lovell, and I'm the Director of Professional Preparation. Terrific. Linda Banks Santilli. Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Banks Santilli. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and a faculty member in special education. Welcome. Paul McCory. You're on mute, Paul. My apologies. <laughs> I'm Paul Akori. Hello, everyone. I'm the Associate Director of Field Education, and it's good to be here with you. I'm in the Office of Professional Preparation. Thanks, Paul. Eleonora Villegas Remers. Hello, everybody. Thank you for, for inviting me to be here. My name is Eleonora Villegas Remers. I am a clinical professor in the Program of Elementary Education, and I'm the Chair of the Department of Teaching and Learning. Thank you. Melissa? Welcome everyone tonight. I'm Melissa Holtz. I'm an associate professor in counseling psychology and the department chair for counseling psychology and applied human development. So as we get started tonight, I want to let everyone know that this session will be recorded and it will be posted on the Wheelock um, page that is uh, entitled COVID student resources. So um, if you know, if you want to circle back and rewatch some of it to get uh, answers uh, to questions that you have or you want to recommend it for someone else, um, you can also show them that it is there if they weren't able to be with us. Ellen and I were able to attend a multi-college event of this sort last week that I suspect some of you were part of and we realized that many of you had questions specifically about Wheelock and you were not able to get your questions answered. So this evening, the focus of our panel is, um, is on curriculum, our teaching, the courses, and what you can expect at Wheelock in the fall. Um, we've curated a group of common questions that many of you submitted from the registration process, and we're going to try to address those um, in our opening remarks, and then um, leave as much time as possible for you to ask specific questions. Um, Questions that are specific to programs will be addressed on an individual basis. We've already begun answering some of these um, through phone calls and emails, and um, we will have staff follow up with you if you uh, provided very specific questions in the registration page. Um, but once we open it up for Q&A, we really want to encourage your participation and look forward to trying to answer as many of your questions as we can. I want to be clear, though, that tonight we're going to try to stay away from questions related to safety and um, uh, uh, student life. We would uh, ask you to refer to the Back to BU website to have those questions answered. If we have a few minutes at the end of our webinar, we, we're happy to try to address those if we have answers um, for your questions. So let's begin by um, having Ellen Fazuski open up the webinar. Thank you very much, David. I just thought it would be important to kind of set the context as to what do we mean about the learn from anywhere model. This model was first described in a document titled Summary of Learn from Anywhere Plan for Undergraduate Programs, which Provost Morrison distributed in late May. The original framing of the model states, the learn from anywhere model means that live face-to-face -face components of a course could also be accessible remotely as they are taking place. 
LFA does not require that all components of a course be delivered live, nor does it preclude some fully remote components, for example, office hours. Under this model, a course may still include asynchronous components delivered wholly online and fully online components. The goal of LFA is to allow students to alternate between in-person and remote attendance, either through planned de-densification strategies, such as platooning or in response to the exigencies of individual students, such as um, students who must quarantine or if they're um, visa issues. So as the description states, it's important for us to remember that students are able to move seamlessly from one environment to the other, going from a face-to-face -face environment to a remote environment as necessary. They can choose at any point in the semester to go from one format to the other. As the result, a student may have a list of classes where some may be fully online, some may be they're attending face to face and then they switch to a remote environment. It's really a combination, it could be a combination and it is up to that student to decide how they would like to participate in their coursework. You do not need to sign up to take classes in person. However, the university is currently looking at a function on the student link in which students can indicate whether they will be in person or remote for the semester. Again, it's important to remember a student can change their status at any time. The majority of our classes at Wheelock are being offered in this Learn From Anywhere format. It's important to note that class days and times are not being adjusted, nor is the academic calendar. If you are planning on participating remotely in a class, you will need to plan on attending during class time in a synchronous manner. It's also important to understand that we are encouraging faculty to record these classes. I encourage you to reach out to your faculty for more specific information about each of the courses that you are currently enrolled in. For students wishing to attend class in person, and depending on the students wishing to participate, the faculty may need to set up a series of rotations. So I use this term platooning uh, a minute or two ago. So for example, if a class meets twice a week, and students want to attend in person, they may need to rotate as to when they're attending in person. So for example, if a class meets twice a week, you may be attending one of those two class sessions each week. Again, it depends on the students who are in the class and what form of participation they are um, conducting. Uh, the last comment that I would like to make is that faculty are already and will be reaching out to their students in each of their classes in the upcoming weeks to ask about whether or not your intention is to um, be remote, to be in person, just so it will help in the planning. Um, again, if you have any questions or concerns, I strongly encourage you to reach out to your faculty. In addition to questions um, in the, uh, related to LFA or the Learn From Anywhere format, there are also some questions about progress to degree. Will the LFA model impact progress to degree? So I'm gonna turn it over to Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Linda Banks Santilli, who will talk a little bit about that. Thank you so much, Ellen. I know this is something that is on many of your minds. You might be wondering, how is the pandemic, um, what effect might it have on my own plans to earn my academic degree? And I know this is so important to all of you and it is equally important to me. Uh, as an Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, it's part of my responsibility. So I work with my colleagues um, and with the faculty to do everything possible to keep you on track. And this evening, we will address some of the questions you might have about, well, you know, I I'm interested in the learn from anywhere, but I have a practicum requirement, or I have an internship that I'm supposed to be doing in the fall, or there's a course that I know has a field-based component to it. So we will be addressing those kinds of questions this evening, but I wanted to just assure you that um, we want very much for you to stay on track with your degree program. And at the same time, we support the Learn From Anywhere model because it uh, provides flexibility and access to the broad range of students at BU. So Ryan, would you be willing to speak a little bit? I know we've had multiple questions about practicum um, and placements and what, for, we just see a question in the uh, Q&A right now about if schools do not reopen. If you would say a couple of remarks about that. Yeah, 
Absolutely, thank you again. Uh, at the outset, I just wanna say that field experience are happening this fall. And if you are placed in a field experience for this fall, you will be positioned to complete that experience. I, I, I think that's really important to emphasize. There are some things we don't know and we wanna be very upfront about that. For one, what your respective field experiences look like will be different for each of you. Some will be face-to-face, -face, some will be remote or virtual, and some will be a combination of both of those. Field experience are not just uh, governed by what your program requires. There are a lot of external rules that we have to follow, state regulations that govern uh, how these field experiences are conducted. We have been talking to several host sites and they are excited to welcome you back. Some other things that we, that we want to be upfront about is that schools are still in the process of developing their plans for what the fall looks like and they are still submitting those plans to the state for approval. So there are details such as what exactly your field experience will look like that we don't know the answer to but we are committed to working with you and with your programs uh, to ensure that you have a successful semester. Thank you Ryan. Um, so just taking a look at the chat so again what we'll do now after these introductory remarks we'd like to just open it up for Q&A so as we see questions coming through um, I will ask a panelist um, to answer the question as it applies to them. Um, so since I'm the one reading the questions, I see there's a question about the LFA model. So originally this, um, the LFA model was um, described in terms of undergraduates, but it also does include graduate um, courses as well. So again, if you have any questions or concerns about what your class may look like, you're still trying to figure out, should I uh, do in-person, should I do, do remote? I highly recommend contacting your faculty member for that. Um, okay, another question that's also just um, dealing with the LFA model in terms of attending in person versus uh, in a remote environment. Do you need to sign up again? Uh, there will be the universities working on a function in the student link to allow students to reflect their status as to whether they'll be face-to-face -face or in a remote environment. Um, again, so it will provide that flexibility that you are looking for. I also, though, highly recommend in addition to the student link is just keeping open communication with your faculty, you know, letting them know whether or not you plan to attend remote in person. And again, with the understanding that as um, Dr. Banks and Tilly had already mentioned, this model has been defined in order to have the greatest degree of flexibility as possible. Um, so again, you don't necessarily need to sign up. If you already have your list of classes in your course schedule, um, then you will be able to just attend those and again, just communicate with your faculty. Um, okay, looks like there is a question for either um, Ryan or Paul that uh, connects to um, completing full-time student teaching in the fall. What happens, you know, you talk a little bit about the schools. What happens if a student gets COVID or the school that the student is going to for their full-time teaching ends up shutting down in a couple of weeks. Again, if you could maybe just talk a little bit more, perhaps Ryan, about how the students will be able to get in the number of hours that they need in order to satisfy program requirements and licensure requirements. Um, so if you could talk a little bit more about that, that would be great. Yeah, thank you again. This, we're fortunate that the state of Massachusetts has given us a great deal of flexibility in how school-based practicum experiences are going to be conducted. Part of this flexibility is, is, is our ability to conduct field experiences in a hybrid format based on what the school may be doing. And I know that sounds very vague, but schools are still developing their plans. We know some uh, schools may reopen late. And just as an aside, I, I think it needs to be mentioned that there will be school this fall. We just don't know exactly what that will look like. And so I, I don't like to you use the phrase schools reopening. Schools will be open this fall. It just may be that the learning 
may be in a different format other than face-to-face. -face. And schools are developing really elaborate and carefully thought out plans around this. And our students who are placed in a school will be able to actively participate in those plans and in those remote learning opportunities. And just a follow-up question, Ryan, and again, this may also go to Dr. Banks and Tilly in terms of just progress to degree. So there was a question that was asked about if a student is considered at risk and they choose not to go through the fields placement due to concern for safe, safety, but they are intending to graduate that semester. Will they need to extend another semester in order to complete that um, field placement? That's a good question, Ellen. I, I think um, that's on students' minds. and. Our thinking is that we would meet with the student, we would meet with the student's academic advisor, we would devise a, perhaps a different plan. If the student is scheduled to graduate, um, we, we may, for example, think about using the semester differently. So we even uh, have the ability to, to try to think outside of the box and think that, um, you know, could the student do something later on in the semester? Could the student do something in the summer? Uh, is it possible for the student to fulfill some of um, his, you know, some of their responsibilities in, in this hybrid remote combination of face-to-face -face that Ryan is describing? So we have a lot of kind of different responses. We sort of have a toolkit and Ryan has indicated that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed has given us flexibility. We've lived through this before, you know, from March through the end of the semester. So we're actually skilled at uh, some of these practices that we didn't um, you know, use as frequently in the past. So I guess that's, it's, it's, um, you know, it's an answer that means we really need to look at every alternative, but I can assure you that we will work um, you know, the, in the best ways that we can to try to keep the student on track for degree completion or closest as possible. And just to clarify, Linda or Ryan, so if a, a student chooses to learn remotely and the field placement is conducted in person, they have that option to participate fully remotely or in person. So again, I'm not gonna be on campus. I wanna, you know, I've got one semester left. Will I be able to conduct my field placement virtually if I will not physically be in Boston? It, the short answer is it depends on what that field placement is and what the requirements are. Um, there are many field experiences that will be able to be offered remotely or virtually. Not all of them may be able to, uh, depending on external rules such as accrediting bodies, um, state regulations, um, but I, I think it's safe to say that uh, many of our field experiences, we will have the flexibility to be, to be pretty flexible, whether it's remote or virtual or um, uh, even a late start in some cases. And I, I just wanted to add, if you're looking at the BU website, you see Learn From Anywhere and then you see a notation and it says, this program may require physical presence. So it, it's just really indicating that yes, it, you, may, you may have a face-to-face -face component, but we will try to work with you to do as much as we can remotely. Um, so we can't, you know, it's dependent on the district, the school, the student, case-by-case -case kind of basis. Our response is, is, is really different. Um, but I do wanna point out, we, you know, we can't guarantee that remotely you'll be able to do a practicum, which is why the notation is on there. But we will do our absolute best to try to give you that opportunity, as Ryan is saying, to do as much as you can remotely and work with you to get the face-to-face -face component, if required, completed in a, in a different way. Thank you. Um, so just in terms of diff different time zones, as we know uh, at Boston University, we have many domestic students, but we also have a lot of international students. And so a question was raised, for example, if I'm living um, in a different time zone, how might that affect my LFA experience? Um, so what we've asked faculty to do that we want them to reach out to their students to find out if there will be some complications in terms of time zone and work with that student. 
We're um, again encouraging faculty to record all of their class sessions so that if a student is unable to participate synchronously, so at the same time as the class is being taught, they will have that asynchronous um, ability to, to participate. Um, again, we um, want to acknowledge the fact that our students are all around the world and be able to work with those students with as much flexibility as possible. Um, another question about practica. <laughs> Do we know when BPS plans will be finalized? Soon. <laughs> well, uh, I am sorry to be, to be vague about that, but they are in process. I, I do think the state has given school districts some extra time. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That um, the challenge of preparing for the fall is so significant. So I think an additional 10 days, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, before they're expected to open um, in whatever format they'll be opening. And we may begin to learn more about district plans in August. And we are in active contact with school district administrations as plans are being developed. What about if I'm a student and I'm, you know, will be participating in a practicum, uh, but I'm not exactly sure what's going to be happening, what the district will decide. Should I personally, as a student, be reaching out to the teacher I'll be working with in my placement, letting them know I won't be in Boston or what are the plans? How would you recommend students interact or communicate with their field sites? Students who are who are placed with a school should follow the direction of both their university supervisor and of the school-based supervisor who would be working with them. Thank you. So you, you may have already answered this, but just to make sure that we're uh, completely clear. So for a student, again, they're in their full practicum. Let's just say partway through the semester, Boston University decides to go fully remote, but the school district is still hybrid. Do we have to adhere to BU policy and not go to practicum? I, I would say that you would still need to go to practicum, but what that practicum looks like and the format it's conducted may be a little different. And those plans may change over, over the course of the semester as, as conditions warrant. Thank you. Um, a follow-up. I know at Wheelock we have our Office of Professional Preparation. We have a lot of resources on that particular website as well as great staff, uh, many of whom we see tonight. Um, if a student wanted to find out more information in regards to state licensure adjustments, so you talked a little bit about flexibility, and I wanted to find out more about that. Um, would I go through the Massachusetts website or should I go to the Office of Professional Preparation website at Wheelock? How will that information be disseminated? I, I, I would encourage anyone who has specific questions about educator licensure, whether it's in Massachusetts or outside of Massachusetts, to, to approach our office. Uh, we have a dedicated email, uh, edlic at bu.edu. And um, we are well equipped to handle questions about licensure. Thank you. I know we're focusing a lot on education tonight, but we also have students that are in other types of placements, for example, hospitals. And I noticed that there was a question in the chat about hospitals and how that may work. Um, Mary Ellen, I don't know if, if Claire White or Paul Fair um, are on this, in this virtual environment somewhere, but as if you could, somehow take a look to see if, if they're here, if they uh, may have a word to say about that. I um, mean, and, and even Paul LaCorey may have something to add to that. So um, Paul, perhaps if you could start, and I believe Claire is on some, oh, perfect, Claire. <laughs> Excellent. Wow, magic. <laughs> Thank you. So Claire, as soon as you unmute yourself, we would love to hear what you have to say. So hi, this is Claire White. I'm the program director for Child Life. And um, we work individually with each student um, in the spring. Of course, um, all of our May graduates completed their internships. We were able to um, combine that 
with a pause, some returned to their internships, and then others um, also completed remote hours. So we really individualize for whatever the situation arises. Um, and so we'll be talking to each student um, about all of this. And um, again, our program always tries to individualize for every situation that might happen. So my, my biggest message is no worries about that because we'll take it step by step. Thank you, Claire. Um, just kind of going back to the, the testing piece, again, we know we want to focus on curriculum, but this may connect a little bit to that LFA model. So we've got a question from Stacy asking about if I decide to attend class in person, what happens if a colleague of mine or a student in the class ends up testing positive? How will the class be contacted? And I think this is a very interesting question because again, it depends on where, let's just say, for example, if a, a fellow peer in your class ends up um, contracting COVID, it, the university will immediately take a look to see who that student has come in contact with, where that exposure may have occurred. So it may be that in a classroom, you may, one of your peers may have um, contracted the virus, but you may not be aware of it because when the student did contract that virus, there was no communication or contact with anybody in that particular class. Um, so the university, as you may have seen from all the information that's being sent out, they are widely invested and heavily invested in testing, the con contact tracing, um, and again, making sure that students are um, you know, receiving the supports that they need. Um, and I think there was also a question that goes back to what happens if I end up switching from a remote environment to an in-person environment. And so um, there are different categories of testing um, and students, if they are coming back to the campus and participating in a remote environment, whether they live on campus or off campus, there will be some testing that is required. I highly recommend going to the Back to BU website for students. Um, it pr will provide up-to-date information that is refreshed every day as we're learning more and more um, about the testing um, and some of the other issues that are being raised. Okay, um, so another question has to do with uh, faculties and, and staff. So perhaps Paul Hastings, you may want to start off answering this question in terms of what will happen if for faculty and staff, will they be available or be in office on a regular basis? So will they be available in person, for example, at Two Silver Way, um, or will they be available only by Zoom? And this perhaps may be for Paul or perhaps may be for Dean Chard as we think a little bit about the, the building um, and safety within the building. Do you want me to start that or David, do you want to start? Well, go ahead, Paul, and I'll follow up if I have Yeah. Any. Sure, I certainly can speak uh, to the uh, question in regards to student services. And I think all of us who work with students um, are gonna have a schedule where we are gonna have a presence on uh, the campus at Two Silver Way. So in student services, we will be taking turns to come into the office to make sure there's coverage um, really throughout the week and be there for students if they'd like to have a face-to-face -face meeting or if they want to simply arrange to have a, a, an off, a webinar or a Zoom meeting as well. But our goal is to be there for students to make sure that when you come to Two Silver Way that you have the opportunity to interact with people who might be helpful to you and answer questions and direct you to various resources. Yeah, uh, the only thing I would add to Paul's response is that we are reconfiguring um, our buildings. So much like you may have experienced in grocery stores so that there's traffic flow in a particular direction and we try to minimize people in close contact as much as possible. Um, and we're trying to de-densify the number of people in the building. So a lot of staff who don't work directly with students are not going to be working on campus and the ones who do direct, uh, work directly with students will be there. So, um, and we're also asking faculty to um, uh, release their courses a few minutes early. So we've got additional passing time between classes and time for people to wipe down spaces um, there will be lots of cleaning supplies available on campus. I did notice in the registration questions, Ellen, someone asked if BU was providing um, PPE, personal protective um, uh, equipment like masks. Um, it's likely there will be um, temporary masks around, but not a full supply. They, so 
we encourage you to get masks um, and face coverings to bring with you. Um, you'll find a lot of that information on the, on the web, uh, website for students related to COVID. And depending on the, the number of questions that we have, again, as Dean Chard mentioned, we want to focus uh, mainly on curriculum tonight. But if we do have some time, I noticed there's a couple questions in the chat. And yes, we did uh, receive a lot of questions and concerns about safety. We will be able to address those. Um, but one that also kind of deals with access to the building um, in terms of just resources that are present within the Wheelock building, will they remain accessible throughout the semester? I don't know, Dean Chart, if you're able to um, add a little bit more to that. So um, in most cases, yes. So for example, the Perkins Library is um, currently working with the central library system to provide um, a way in which there could be contact, um, is it contactless um, lending? So that if you need resources with, from Perkins, there will be librarians who will access that and make it available to you. Um, I don't yet have a um, schedule for when Perkins will reopen. Um, I think that's part of the larger library systems decision making for, for that purpose. Thank you. It looks like we're starting to get some questions coming in about safety, but again, I would like to just, I don't know if any of the panelists would like to add one or two more things perhaps that you may have thought of that um, you want to add about curriculum, field placement, um, any of those experiences, or if anyone in the audience has other questions related to um, what, what their uh, learning environment may look like in the, in the fall. Ellen, I, I wonder if you um, can, someone asked about what what it will feel like if you're in remote in an LFA class. There are videos available for people to watch so they can see there are, you might talk a little bit about what the classroom technology is going to look like and um, just briefly. Absolutely. Uh, so it's actually quite impressive uh, to be honest. So what the university is doing is they're looking at all of those teaching classrooms and um, putting in extra technology as necessary in order to uh, be able to satisfy this learn from anywhere environment. Um, so for example, there will be uh, cameras located at the back of the classrooms in order to capture um, student interaction as well as the faculty member. There will also be additional microphones, for example, hanging down from the ceiling that will be able to capture the sound and the conversation uh, that is happening in those classrooms. Um, so again, trying to picture what it might look like. So we need to be considerate of the, um, the social distancing. So the number of students who can be in a classroom at a time. So faculty are just, we're finalizing where the, um, the faculty will will be teaching their classes. So they're um, just getting that information now. Um, so again, keeping in mind, there will be um, a certain percentage of their students that will be allowed to be face-to-face. Uh, -face. So while there are some students that are in that face-to-face -face environment, the rest of the students will be participating in a remote environment. And so depending on the size of the class, there will be classroom moderators, which will help facilitate uh, be able to help the faculty member connect to that remote environment with the in-person environment. Uh, for example, if there are questions that are being raised or comments that are being raised in that remote environment, the faculty member will be aware of those um, comments and questions uh, through the aid of a classroom moderator. Um, as Dean Char just mentioned, um, there are a couple of, um, there are some demo rooms that are being set up. So faculty will have the opportunity to go and look at the technology and really begin to think again what their classrooms may look like. Um, so as August, I, um, it's amazing to think that August is going to be starting in a couple of days, um, but the um, university has been working very hard to outfit these rooms. Normally it takes, I believe I heard today, about 16 months to be able to retrofit uh, these classrooms. We're doing it within, what, a six-month period or so. Um, so again, we'll have that extra technology in there. Um, and again, depending on the number of students who want to participate, it may be, again, that students are rotating in, so students may attend one day, and then the next time they end up um, participating in a re remote environment so that the other students will be able to participate face-to-face. -face. So again, I know I've said this a couple of times before, really important to communicate with your faculty uh, because they'll be able to provide you the information, let you know what it is that they're thinking of, um, and really thinking about how this Learn From Anywhere model can support the pedagogy that they use in their class to make sure that all students achieve the learning objectives of the class and all students have an equitable opportunity to um, achieve the, the learning objectives. I don't know if there's anything else, Dean Char, that you'd like me to add to that or if that... 
No, that's very helpful. Um, and I guess just to add to that, so, um, and, and Dr. Banks and Tilly may be able to add a little bit more about it, about when professors will be assigned. So again, they're, um, Linda, I don't know if you want to address this at all um, in terms of just assigning of classrooms and when faculty will know for certain which classrooms they will be in. Yes, um, that's being determined right now. And I guess I would just ask students for their patience because you can imagine with six foot distancing, uh, we have to look at space in an entirely different way. And in the past, you might have been a student who might have added a course or, you know, the add drop period. You still will have an opportunity to do that, but we have to look at those processes really carefully. So all of those services that um, continue to happen through the student records office, we're all here and we're all able to process substitutions and waivers and but in terms of um, classroom space, it really is quite different and we have to do some thinking about it, some problem solving. It's not automatically what it was in the past that you could just be added to a class. Um, sometimes we'll have to look and see if the classroom space is large enough. And we have to limit, uh, in some cases, uh, over-enrolling courses. Um, we also have to really you know, think about, is this course being offered remote? In that case, it's easier to add a student so I, I have learned, um, Ellen, in the, in the next two weeks, the rooms will be finalized, but BU is doing, I think, an outstanding job really considering, uh, you know, student safety first, and also the, uh, the regulations about um, social distancing and, you know, determining the right classroom spaces um, because of, of the changes um, that the pandemic bring to us. And just to, to add a follow-up question, um, so we talk about assigning of classroom space. So is it um, safe to assume that all faculty have been assigned to classes? Do all of our classes that are listed, for example, in a student's schedule, they have a faculty member assigned to them? Or what if I look at my class schedule and I see that no professor is assigned to that particular class? Well, the professors are assigned to the courses for the fall. You might, um, you might identify one or two courses that still stay, say staff for instructor, but that doesn't mean a person hasn't been identified. That simply means that that person is moving through the appointing process. So everything is completely staff for the fall. And faculty um, have room assignments, but they're not definite yet. So we're awaiting um, you know, final word from the central registrar at BU to finalize those rooms. So the, the space right now that students might be looking at that's identified could change. So that's kind of the point we're at now. Thank you so much. Um, and just a, a follow-up comment, uh, someone, um, Grace had asked about book lists becoming available. So as faculty are working on their syllabi, um, the, fa the students, I believe it's a three week window out from the start of the semester that listed on the university website, the bookstore website, students will know which books they will need uh, for the particular classes. And again, if you have questions about what particular um, books may be required for your class, I highly recommend to uh, reach out um, to your faculty member. That's, that's a really good idea because I think people use a variety of, of um, books. They don't all use one system. Some people are using electronic books. So yeah, faculty should be in touch with their students. And if not, students should be in touch with the faculty. Thank you. Um, question was asked about, will BU be using their own software, for example, using Zoom to conduct remote classes? And then how does Blackboard integrate with that learning style? So the university will be using Zoom again in the fall. Um, it is a supported. We offer trainings to faculty as well as to students on how to use Zoom. Um, so essentially, that is just the, the technology that we will use to connect students in a remote environment with face-to-face, -face, or if a course is fully remote, on how students will connect with one another. Blackboard is a learning management system in which faculty can use Blackboard in order to post videos, post documents, um, have discussion boards, upload assignments. Um, so again, it's kind of a, a, a different type of tool in which um, the faculty should be using it for the course. It's really as more of a repository, if you will, uh, for different types of course information that students will be able to access regardless of where they are. 
Um, so again, the university uh, supports Zoom and Blackboard as well as some other technologies. Um, we have Kaltura, for example, Media Capture, which is using for video editing of videos. Um, we also have um, trainings that will be occurring for Pronto, which is similar to Slack, um, if, if students are, are familiar with that. Um, but again, there will be some integrations of additional technologies, but the main platform that will be used in the fall is Zoom and Black Blackboard. Um, okay. So um, again, I think we kind of talked a little bit about office hours. Uh, for faculty, again, I think it uh, uh, will be up to the faculty to remember to how those office hours will occur. Um, I think in uh, just following up with Dean, what Dean Chart had said about safety, the number of faculty in a particular building or number of people in a building, we will need to uh, regulate that in terms of the social distancing to make sure we're ensuring the safety of our faculty, staff, and our students. Um, so again, I think it will be a mixture of both in-person as well as uh, virtual. Okay, here's a question for the uh, licensure practicum people. Um, if I'm a student pursuing two licenses that require two separate practicums, would it be possible to complete both within one semester? Is there talk of this with DESI? Probably not, uh, very unlikely. Even if your practicum is remote, if the school is remote, that's still considered pretty close to a full-time experience to complete the, the requirements for that. Um, so the short answer is no. Linda, you talked a little bit about courses um, and, and talking about the looking at over enrollment, especially thinking about safety, social distancing, number of students. How can students ensure that they get the credits they need if it's required? So I, I need a course, it's required. I'm concerned that it's already at full capacity. How will Wheelock um, make sure that I, I'm able to access courses that I need or credits that I need in order to fulfill my program requirements. And if I am unable to take a course in the fall, will those courses be offered in the spring, for example? A couple thoughts on that. And, and one is, um, if the course is being offered fully remote, you can be added to the course. It's much easier to add you to a fully remote course than to a learn from anywhere course. And you might be wondering, well, why is a course going to be fully remote? In some cases, and it's a really quite a small number compared to the number of courses we're offering, but in some cases, um, a faculty member may be uh, receiving an accommodation to teach a class um, due to a medical condition remotely or to other conditions and has been approved um, confidentially by the university. So we may have a fully remote class that you can enter, even if it's showing up as full right now. You would, um, you would contact uh, the uh, registrar's office, the student records office, that email comes to Tom, the assistant registrar and me, and we begin problem solving with the faculty that are involved. So we would try to get you into that course. If we couldn't get you into the course, or if we saw a pattern that there were several students who needed one course, um, again, the student records office would keep track of that, almost sort of like a list if we had enough students, we could possibly open up another section. Um, I would you know, then confer with the Dean for Faculty Affairs and see if that's something that we need to do. And then lastly, yes, we could look at courses that students really need and we would ensure that they would be offered in the spring semester. Or another alternative is a directed study that sometimes works or an independent study. It's called a directed study at the undergrad level and an independent study for graduate students. And that would mean petitioning a faculty member uh, who has agreed to work with you on a specific uh, project related to the curriculum in a course or a project outside of that course. So those are some options that we would begin to um, consider. Thank you. Um, this is a, a, a follow-up question for Lynn and perhaps Dean Chard. Um, so a student in the, in the chat is mentioning that they're hearing from some of their faculty um, that due to personal circumstances, they will be providing their classes fully remotely. 
So the student is saying, you know, if, if the classes I'm enrolled in become only remotely available due to the professor's situations and I don't get the option of choosing the in-person attendance, are there other ways for us to have that in-person option, taking advantage of that hybrid type model? So perhaps you could talk about um, the percentage of courses that will be offered in that LFA model. And what, what would you recommend to a student if they're noticing that many of their courses are remote and that they would like to have that in-person option? If you could talk more about that, that'd be great. So I'll start with um, letting people know that we've um, worked very carefully with faculty, as Ellen mentioned, who, or Linda mentioned, who need to um, not be on campus for their own health and safety. Um, currently, about 10% of our graduate courses and 10% of our undergraduate courses are going to be fully remote um, to accommodate those, uh, those health and safety issues. That means about 90% of our classes are going to be offered in the LFA model, meaning both remote and face-to-face. Um, -face. If you are um, uh, concerned about a class and you would prefer that it were in person, I would recommend you either talk with our advising staff or with your specific advisor about whether or not you could make a change to your schedule. Um, and I, I don't want to get into the weeds of that because there are people on the, um, on the panel who know a whole lot more about advising than I do. So maybe Paul or Linda could jump in on that. I would just second what Dean Chard just said. So the good thing about BU is it has a wide variety of courses that students can take. Uh, particularly if you're an undergrad, um, you can take courses in, in so many schools and colleges through the BU Hub. So we would try to uh, work with your advisor. So the first step is go to your academic advisor to explain the situation. And then we'd work with that advisor in student records to identify a substitute course, another course that that's curriculum is aligned with the one that was required. And you would probably complete a substitution request through student records and it would go to your advisor for approval and it comes to me for approval. So I think that's the best way to go about it, to find a course that is offered in the LFA model. If you're eager to do that, participate in that way and we could, we could help uh, match the curriculum for you. Thank you. Um, a question about assessment, types of assessment, tests and exams, how will they be given to ensure academic integrity in an online or in-person capacity? And I think this is a question that um, faculty have been um, thinking about since we ended up going remote in the spring. Um, throughout the university, there are a variety of presentations, trainings, um, conversations that are happening about assessment. How can we effectively assess what our students know or do not know in this remote environment? Um, and so there are a lot of conversations that are happening, thinking about alternative forms of assessment, not just an exam-based assessment, but understanding that there are multiple types of assessment that can be used um, and implemented in our classes um, in this uh, remote environment. So I think it depends a little bit on the faculty member, it might depend a little bit on the course content, but faculty have already been thinking about this for months. Um, and so we, uh, we're on top of the uh, academic integrity piece. Um, in addition to that, the university is also working on a, um, a statement in which students um, that we can include in our syllabi that focus specifically on academic integrity in this uh, learn from anywhere model. Um, so really as faculty um, and staff uh, making sure that we are letting our students know about what we expect from them um, in terms of this integrity piece. Um, and again, thinking about alternative forms of assessment. Um, Perhaps Ryan or, or someone from OPP can talk a little bit. I know we're, we're, we're focusing a lot on, for example, full-time practicum. Could you just speak a little bit more about pre-prac? Uh, you know, I want to participate in a pre-prac experience. Um, but what, what, what are we doing with pre-pracs? We have the flexibility to do a lot of the pre-practicum uh, requirements remotely or, or um, using various software platforms that programs are, are adopting, whether that's um, um, observations, uh, using pre-recorded videos. There is a portion of the pre-practicum that traditionally is done face-to-face, -face, but again, we have a lot of flexibility with that. They, they can participate, uh, interact with, with students live in a in a remote or virtual fashion depending on 
what their school placement is doing. We also have the flexibility with a pre-practicum to begin that school-based portion later, and some programs may be shifting the timing around with that. Would that be springtime, Ryan? It could be spring. It also could be shifting to later in the fall semester. Uh, for those, for that portion of the the pre-practicum that requires, um, it's going to sound weird, but live access to students, there might even be, be the flexibility to, so for instance, if a student is normally able to do their full practicum in the spring, maybe that portion of the pre-prac can be done at the beginning of their, of their full prac in the spring, if that makes sense. Very helpful. Yeah, so again, thinking about scheduling of pre-prac, um, you know, are, are there a lot of pre-prac experiences offered in the fall? Will there be enough of them that uh, occur in the spring as well if, if needed? So it sounds like you, you just answered that, Brian, so thank you. Um, another question going back to the LFA model, will students um, taking classes in person need to take their laptops? Um, so David, I would highly encourage you to bring your laptop with you. I think faculty, again, we're still uncertain as to how many students will be in that in-person face-to-face environment versus the remote. Um, so I know myself as a faculty member, I'm definitely planning on bringing my laptop with me. So I would encourage that. But again, I think it also depends on your faculty member. So reach out to the faculty member to see if that's something that you, um, that you should do. Okay, there was just a question about lab safety, uh, but it looks like it just disappeared. Paul, you, you answered that already. Um, Eleanor, I don't know if you have any extra information just in terms or, or perhaps Dean Chard um, in regards to the science courses that are taught in our building in terms of lab safety. Is there anything that students may want to be aware of when it comes to space or? David or? Well, I, I think um, like all of our courses, there's uh, likely to have to be a system of circulating students depending on the size of the class. If the class is small enough, then the in-person lab experiences um, are likely to be like they are every year. Um, if the class is too large for the capacity of the lab space, then the professors are going to work out a schedule so that everyone can have some time in that space. If you're choosing to attend using the LFA format, it will be the professor's um, responsibility to experiment with how to make that meaningful for you if you're remote. And I have faith in our uh, science faculty that they're going to figure out how to make that um, both uh, meaningful and exciting. So. And the planning has already begun. The faculty that are teaching science courses have already begun to work on a plan based on what we know and what and the space that we have available. And I also saw that TJ McKenna responded in the chat to the specific question about safety in the lab. And he said it's something that they discuss regularly at the beginning of the semester. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Question about work study jobs. So Paul, I'm gonna direct, Paul Hastings direct this to you because I believe you received some information today. Are students able to participate in work study if there are positions open? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you have been awarded a work study position, uh, the BU has a work study uh, site where they list all jobs that are currently available. Um, if you were employed by one of our offices at Wheelock uh, in the past, you might want to contact your supervisor to find out if you can uh, return to that position. So, for example, in student services, we had positions uh, in work study positions last year, and we were notified today that we can rehire for those existing positions. Um, so please uh, contact either the BU office, student employment office, or your managing supervisor from your previous uh, employment. Thank you, Paul. So we're almost out of time, um, and I think I will uh, hand the reins back over to Dean Chard, but just to answer one last question in terms of this recording. So perhaps um, just as, as a reminder, this recording will be available um, to students. Um, if you would, as, as Dean Chard mentioned, circle back, or if you know students who are unable to attend, um, would like some information from this webinar, it will be located on the BU Wheelock uh, COVID site under student resources. Uh, so it may take a day or two in order to 
upload the video. Um, but again, just reemphasizing what Dean Chard had mentioned. Thank you so much for all of you who had solicited the questions ahead of time. That really helped us prepare um, and think about the, the questions that you had. And as Dean Chard mentioned, in terms of specific questions, um, if we have not reached out to you already, we will do so um, very quickly to make sure that those questions are answered. And we encourage you to continue to reach out uh, to us if you have additional questions. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to Dean Chard. Well, and first of all, let me thank my colleagues for coming tonight and being part of this and answering um, all of these questions. And let me thank the participants for being part of um, this evening's event. I want to kind of reiterate what um, Ellen is saying. Everyone on this panel tonight has an email address, and you can find us all on the um, BU WeLock website. So if you did not get your questions answered, please feel free to reach out to any of us. We're all um, eager to answer your questions. It's very important to us that you feel safe coming to campus if you choose and that you feel comfortable with the learn from anywhere uh, model if, um, if that is, if you choose to learn remotely. Um, we wanna be sure that you're getting a meaningful experience from, uh, from this semester. Most importantly, we're worried about your health and safety. So we wanna be sure that um, you're able to pursue your um, degree programs, your professional preparation in a manner that keeps you safe and healthy. So thank you all. We look forward to seeing you soon um, in our classes or on campus. And um, in the meantime, be safe and try to enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you.